it actually is the anatomy of an inter vivos trust. It's not the autonomy, although uh, some could argue that trust could be autonomous. I'll tell you that I think trusts are the most misunderstood uh, documents and misused. And one is that sometimes people think in terms of um, the dichotomy of revocable and irrevocable trust as if there's just one revocable trust and one irrevocable trust. So the first thing you have to know is there are many different types of especially irrevocable trusts that are used for many different purposes and we'll talk about that. And a revocable trust can have many different terms and there are different purposes for that and we will talk about that too. But as an example, I had someone who came in to me who had a rather large estate a few weeks ago and they had a trust and they told me that there were very complex terms as to who could be the trustee for their children. And they told me that the reason they had that was because they were told that their children couldn't be their own trustee, which is really not the truth anymore. It used to be, but that law was changed a long time ago, which reminds me of a story that we often uh, tell in my office about the young bride who has a, uh, she's trying to cook for her new spouse and she wants to make a ham. And she asks her mother for the recipe and the mother gives her a recipe. She says, cut off the ends of the ham, put it in the pan, put the sauce over it, put it in the oven, cook it at 375 for a period of time and uh, they'll be ready. And she says to her mother, well, why do you cut off the edges? She said, well, I don't know, because that's how my mother told me to do it. And she calls her mother, the girl's, the bride's grandmother, and says, well, you know, why do we cut off the end? She said, well, I, I can't remember anymore. She calls her sisters and her aunts, and finally she learns the reason why they cut off the ends was because the pan was too small that they cooked it in. And I say that Lots of times when I see the same thing happens with trust, people are using terms that no longer apply and limiting the ability to really use that trust and use it well for the purposes that we have today. So that's why I wanna go through this slowly with you and have you understand it. If you're a lay person, one of the reasons why I do these seminars is because I believe you should understand everything that you sign. And if you don't understand it, you have to ask questions because otherwise you're doing it really with a um, faith in the attorney who's drafted it. And I think that's misplaced. If you're going to sign it and it's going to be part of your estate plan, you should understand it. And for attorneys and other practitioners, financial advisors out there, it's good to know what these terms mean. So the first most basic question is what is a trust? And the trust is really a document that's put together, an agreement between a trustee and a grantor or a settler about how money or assets in the trust will be managed. Uh, so in terms of um, the document, we talk about an inter vivos trust. Today, I am not talking about anything but inter vivos trust. Now, an inter vivos trust is a standalone trust a trust that's created during your lifetime, as opposed to a testamentary trust, which is created in a will document and does not come alive until the person dies and the trust, the will is probated, and then the trust that's in that will um, is created. So oftentimes, if you hear about a living trust, a living revocable trust, that is a trust that's created during your lifetime. Now, there are trust terms you should know. One is grantor. That is typically the person who creates the trust and oftentimes the person who funds the trust, puts assets in the trust. That's not always true. About You can have a trust that's created by a grantor, a maker, a trust maker, a settler, uh, and other people can put assets in it. But by and large, the grantor is the trust maker. Then there's the trustee. That's the person who manages the trust. And depending again, what kind of trust it is, it may be the same person as the grantor, or it may be another person. And then there's the beneficiary. And typically there's a lifetime beneficiary. 
and then the remainder beneficiaries, as well as contingent remainders. But really the three terms are grantor, trustee, and beneficiary. Now, there are many different purposes for doing a trust. Uh, one is for tax planning. The other would be a Medicaid qualifying trust, which is created to protect assets in case you need Medicaid. Um, sometimes a trust is created simply to avoid probate. And when I talk about probate, I mean that when you die and you have a will, the executor, in order to manage and you know, to collect your assets, pay your bills, and distribute to your beneficiaries, must go to court and be appointed by the court as the executor. So even though you've named someone in your will, they do not act as executor until they've actually been appointed by the court. And that process can be lengthy and it could be expensive depending on what the terms of that will are and what your situation is. So many times we have people who avoid probate by putting their assets in the trust and not having to go through the probate process process at their death. Um, and in addition to the Medicaid qualifying trust, which protects assets for Medicaid purposes, there are other trusts that also give creditor protection beyond Medicaid to general creditors. Um, then there are different distributions method, methods in trust. For instance, when you have a trust and you put assets into the trust, there's the principal, right? So say it's a house or it's a bank account for $50,000. That's the asset going into the trust. But anything that's earned on that, so dividends and interest, is income. So there is usually a distribution, a distribution provision for the income. How is it going to be distributed every year? Does it get paid out? Is it mandatory? Does it accumulate in the trust? And those are things that have to be considered because a trust is, is taxed at the very highest rate of income tax. So uh, you want to be careful if it's an asset that earns income, what are the distribution, distribution methods for that income? Another standard is HEMS, Health, Education, Maintenance, and Support. We call that an ascertainable standard. And the question is, does the trustee have the discretion to make distributions to beneficiaries for health, education, maintenance, and support. There are other standards, but they're not what we call ascertainable standards, and that's a term of art that's used in the code. Uh, typically, if you have someone who has an interest in the trust, someone who maybe is a future beneficiary, a possible beneficiary, and they are acting as trustee, typically their ability to distribute assets is limited to health, education, maintenance, and support. And then you can have another trustee who's an independent trustee or someone who's not interested who can distribute for any uh, purpose. And many times in a trust, you might have an interested trustee and then uh, the ability to appoint an independent trustee if there isn't one already appointed in the trust. Okay, so those are basic terms. And it sounds like a lot of legalism. So let's take some actual examples. Say, for instance, the trust that I'm sure everyone has um, heard about, which is the revocable living trust. Now, oftentimes clients come to me and they think that that trust is going to save them estate taxes. And the truth is that a revocable living trust is a trust in which you are the grantor, you're typically the trustee. You don't have to be, but typically you want to be. And you name your beneficiaries. Since that you have full control over that trust, one, it uses your social security number. It's what we call a grantor trust. So whether the income comes, in the, comes out of the trust or stays in the trust, it will still be taxed to you, no matter what. Uh, <coughs> typically, you have the right to to amend that trust, to take assets out, to, to terminate it, to do whatever you want. Uh, the reason for that trust, by and large, is to avoid probate at your death. And the question is, why would you want to avoid probate? And there are a number of reasons. 
One might be that you have disinherited people who would otherwise have the right to object to a will. So if you don't want, when you die, there to be a long protect, projected or protracted uh, argument lit litigation about your estate, you can avoid it entirely by putting your assets in a revocable trust, managing them during your lifetime, and then upon your death, they would pass without there being a proceeding where people who would otherwise inherit from you could now object to the will. Um, sometimes we have revocable trust often because we own real property in different states. And the rule is that every state has the right to control the probate process for land, real property in that state. So if you have property in three different states, you will have likely probate in each state if you own that property in your sole name. Um, another reason you might want to do a revocable trust is you want to have a trust that you can name as the beneficiary for maybe some retirement benefits or, or life insurance. So for instance, I might have a couple that's rather young, but they have a lot of life insurance. They can name each other as the beneficiary and there are pros and cons to that, but what if they both die? How do they name minor children? So one of the simpler things to do is to create that revocable trust, which they may or may not fund during their lifetime, but certainly at their death, it creates a trust for their children and the life insurance and the retirement benefits could, be, could name that trust as the beneficiary. Uh, the only creditor or the only tax advantage to the revocable trust, um, well, there are two, two different cases. One is if you create what we call marital or bypass trust for a surviving spouse upon your death, that is a tax saving uh, vehicle to create those trusts. However, you could do that in a will document as well. And there's another, uh, instance where you can use a joint trust, which I'll talk about later, and achieve a full step up in basis at the death of either spouse. Now that's getting complicated. Don't get nervous. We'll get to that. Um, one thing I, I will tell you, um, one of the things that I see is sometimes I'll have clients with highly appreciated real property that they own as husband and wife. And they go to a seminar and they realize, oh, well, I want to trust and I'll create this revocable trust. You know, avoid probate at my death and I'll put everything in the trust. And again, it's like the pan and the ham and cutting the edges off. And so, for instance, I had a client out east in East Hampton that had a house that had appreciated quite a bit. It was worth, I think, about $4 million when they came to see me. They already had revocable trust. And even though they didn't have one of the reasons to avoid probate, they had decided to do a, a revocable trust and they transferred that deed that they owned as husband and wife into the, their trust. And the husband had a trust and the wife had the trust and they each put half into their own trust. Which then, of course, if the wife died, said the trust would continue, continue for the benefit of her husband. And the problem was that uh, when they put the deed into the trust, they, set, they, um, they ran afoul of a van an advantage under the tax law. Had they kept the house in their joint names as husband and wife, when the husband died, there would have been a 100% step up in basis. So imagine the house was worth four million. I think their basis in the house was about uh, $300,000. So there was a gain of 3.7 million. Had they left it in their name under this Gallenstein decision, when the husband died, the basis, the cost basis would have been stepped up to the 4 million on his date of death. And if the wife later sold the property, she would have no capital gains. By putting the house and deeding the house half into each trust, they destroyed the tenancy by the entirety. When the husband died, there was only a half of a step up in basis to two million. And the wife had a gain, 
because her half was worth two million minus 150, which was the, the cost basis, it was $1.85 million gain. So until her death, there would not be a full step up in basis. She wanted to sell it after his death, she would only have a $250,000 capital gains exemption, which would mean that she would pay capital gains on $1.6 million. At 33%, you can do the math. So just because you have the trust uh, and it seems like, well, you should fund it and put everything in, into it, you could be causing a problem that you didn't have to solve. You didn't it really avoiding probate wasn't the issue. She had a spouse. If she left in joint names, and then when her husband died, there would be a full step up in basis. She could have then put the house or sold it and put the proceeds in her trust and avoided probate. And there was no other underlying tax reason for them up to put this house in the trust. So I that is a tale of caution uh, that. One size doesn't fit all. And in that case, it really was harmful that they had done that. And there was no way to reverse it. Now, so that's the revocable trust. The other uh, trusts I want to talk about are irrevocable trusts. I have to caution you that there are many types of irrevocable trusts. I will only talk about a few today. Uh, I, this, uh, the most important trust that we use in elder law today is the Medicaid qualifying trust. And that is an irrevocable trust. Often clients come in and say, I want to sell my, I, I want to protect my house, I want to protect my house, my assets, but I don't want, I want it to be a revocable trust. Well, you can't do that. If you have full access to a trust and it's a revocable trust, then it is counted as an asset for Medicaid purposes. So the only way to protect a house uh, using a trust would be to use a Medicaid qualifying trust. Uh, that trust, to go back to the terms I used before, would be a grantor trust. So that means even though the house is owned by the trust, and the trust will likely have its own tax ID number. Now, there's some discussion about that. If the trust is a, considered a grantor trust, some people say, well, you can still use the grantor social security number because all the tax consequences flow through to the grantor. But when we do a Medicaid qualifying trust, we do not use their social security number. We issue a, uh, we get a tax ID number from the IRS because for Medicaid, it's the best way to go. Uh, the other thing about the Medicaid qualifying trust is that the grantor cannot be the trustee. So for instance, I have a mother who comes in She's a widow, she has a house, it's worth $500,000, she wants to protect it. She can create the trust, she would be the grantor of the Medicaid qualifying trust, but she cannot be the trustee. But she can name one, two, or multiple trustees. I try to discourage multiple trustees, but I will tell you that I do, in fact, give that mother the right to change the trustee at any time. And that's important. Even though it's an irrevocable trust, she can have the right to change the trustee. She would likely name her children as lifetime beneficiaries. She would be um, the income beneficiary. So again, if she has a CD that's worth $50,000, every time that CD rolls over, she gets the interest that's earned on it. If it's a stock account, she gets the dividend interest on it any income interest. If it's real property, she has the right to live there. Or if she rents it, she has the right to collect the rents. All item, items of income go to her. Now, the trust doesn't have to be written like that. I had a woman call me a few weeks ago who said, listen, I don't, my mom doesn't want to take the income from the trust because she already has a large income. And if she goes into, on to uh, Medicaid, she'll have to use that income to pay the nursing home. So she would rather it accumulates in the trust. And that can be done and it can still be a grant or trust even though she doesn't get the income. So these are some of the things that you have to consider and project forward. Uh, there are some trusts that say the trustee may give the grantor the income in the trustee's discretion. 
I will tell you that as far as, far as Medicaid is concerned, that uh, if the trustee has the ability to give it, whether they exercise that discretion or not, the income will be counted as the Medicaid applicant's income. So that's a consideration. And then trust, so if mom's the lifetime beneficiary for income, usually there's a way to give principal distribution gifts to the children. If the trustee is an interested trustee, remember I used that term before, then they can give gifts for health, education, maintenance, or support. If it's an independent trustee or they appoint an independent trustee, then gifts can be made of principal to the other beneficiaries for any reason. But remember, principal never goes back to the grantor. Because if you can give the principal grantor, then it's not a Medicaid qualifying trust. Uh, because it's a grantor trust, it's still part of the grantor's taxable estate, so you still get the step up in basis. In addition, if you sell the house during your lifetime, you still get the 200, as long as it's your primary residence, and you've lived there two years, you, you uh, satisfy the code, you can get your $250,000 exemption from capital gains. And also, typically, there's language in the trust that allows you to get your star exemption or homestead exemption. So that trust is very well suited for Medicaid planning. And typically, if it's a spouse, it continues for the spouse's benefit and then terminates upon the death of the second spouse and then usually goes to the children and usually goes to them in descendants' trust. I, I see there might be some questions. Liz, are you there? Could you see? I am. Yep, we've got two questions. The first one, can a trustee remove money from the living expenses of the person who the trust was made for, irrevocable trust? Okay, so I think the question is, can the trustee take money from the trust and pay for living expenses of the grantor? And my answer would be no. If this is a Medicaid qualifying trust, and that's the only irrevocable trust I've spoken about so far, then you pay the income or use the income from the trust to pay expenses, but you cannot give principal. So I suppose if the income was 300 a month and you use the 300 by paying for something for the grantor, that's not a problem. But typically what I prefer to do is to make it very clean because you're dealing with Medicaid and they will be looking at five years worth of, of uh, trust statements. The cleaner thing to do is to pay the income to the penny to the grantor and then let the grantor's account pay expenses. Then it's very clear, you paid nothing but income. Because I will tell you, especially here in Suffolk County, if you use any principle whatsoever from the trust, they will consider the trust tainted and count it as available. Thank you. Next question. Does the beneficiary need a lawyer to change title of the real estate they receive when the grantor dies? Uh, typically, uh, I mean, uh, most people use a lawyer to draft up a deed. They don't in all states, but someone who knows how to prepare a deed has to prepare the deed that transfers the property from the trust to whoever it's going to, maybe to another trust or to uh, an individual. And that's done by, done by deed. I had someone last week who came in with a deed and it took her about six months and she kept going back to the county clerk and finally she came in and hired us for a nominal amount to prepare the deed. So, I mean, typically that's what you want to do. Okay, that's it as far as- Thank you, I do. Okay. Yeah. So that's the Medicaid qualifying trust. And it's a trust that everybody pretty much knows about. It's very commonly used. But it's by no means the only type of irrevocable trust there is. Another one that's pretty uh, well established in the field of estate planning is the irrevocable life insurance trust, otherwise known as an ILIT, I -L -I -T. That trust is used to own real estate, uh, I'm sorry, to own life insurance on the life of the grantor. So many people are so surprised. They say, do you mean life insurance is taxable in my estate? And the answer is yes. If you have the instance of ownership and you can change the beneficiary, then it is part of your taxable estate. 
So even a young couple with almost no money, but you know, millions of dollars in, in life insurance, they may want to put that in a trust so it will not be taxable at their death. Uh, so we use a life insurance trust to do that. Uh, the idea is unlike the Medicaid qualifying trust, life insurance trust assets are out of your taxable estate. So it doesn't matter if it's life insurance because you move the policy and typically it's better to buy the policy, the trustee to buy the policy at the first instance. If I have a grantor who creates an island and puts an existing policy in, then they must survive that transfer by three years. Otherwise, the insurance is still taxable in their estate. Some people have no choice, but if you do have a choice, it's better for the trust in the first instance to buy the policy. Uh, so therefore, then it's not part of the taxable estate. Um, and then typically the premiums are paid usually on an annual basis and the trust can get money by gifts from the grantor to the trust which can pay the premiums. So for instance, you know that uh, uh, anyone can give up to $15,000 a year tax-free to, to any number of individuals. So if you have premiums on a life insurance policy there are 30,000 a year, and say you put in, the, the insurance is owned by the islet and you have two children who are beneficiaries, you can give the trust $30,000 a year tax-free, which the trustee can then use to pay the premiums. Uh, typically though, the children or the beneficiaries have to have some present right to that money. So the case was crummy, against the commissioner. And the claim was, listen, the person who created the insurance trust uh, put money in a trust, but it was a future benefit because the kids were not getting any money until he died and that policy was uh, paid to the trust. And so that's a gift of a future interest. So therefore you can't use the annual exclusion of $15,000 uh, per person. And therefore the 15,000 or 30,000 a year would come off his lifetime gift amount with the uh, federal exemption. And the way you get around it is you give a crummy letter to the beneficiary that says, I'm paying for this policy, you have 30 days to demand that amount. If it lapses, which any smart beneficiary will allow happen, they're not taking the money that would pay the policy, then the money's in the trust and can be used to pay the premium. So it's a good way to shift and take money uh, from a taxable estate, make these annual gifts to the trust and have the trust leverage it with an insurance policy. Uh, and those are called crummy powers. Now, what I will tell you, and then I'll take the two questions that are, are uh, I see the hands raised, is that so many times we'll do a Medicaid qualifying trust for a client and I'll get a call in April frantic I spoke to my accountant, I told him I did an irrevocable trust, and my accountant said it was the worst thing I could do. Now the trust is going to pay a higher rate of income tax, because I told you trusts pay a higher rate of income tax, and I'm not going to get my exemption if I sell the house, or my exemption from capital gains, and I'm going to lose my star exemption, and I not uh, and I'm not going to get a step up in basis when I die. And what's happening is that the accountant doesn't realize that this is not an islet. If they're not familiar with Medicaid qualifying trust, they're confusing the two. And in fact, if you had a house and you wanted to protect it, you would not put it in an islet because you wouldn't get the $250,000 exemption. You wouldn't get the step up in basis at your death and you would be penalized in terms of the income tax. And there's a perfect example where two irrevocable trusts are not the same. One is a grantor trust, and the islet is most likely a grantor trust for income tax purposes, but not for estate tax purposes. Okay, I see a few questions, so I might as well, uh, Liz, you want to give them to me? You, you got it. Uh, when can trustee give gifts to beneficiaries in a Medicaid trust, and do they pay tax? Okay, so typically a gift from the 
um, you know, when we talk about 2020, you, I just said you can give any number of individuals $15,000 a year tax free. So if you have five kids, the trust can give $15,000, $75,000 tax free. In addition, there's also the federal and the state. So federal, the exemption is well over $11 million. So if your trust, your Medicaid trust, gives a gift to the children that's over $15,000 each, then that amount that's over would come off the federal exemption. But as I said, each, each uh, you, husband and wife, or even if you're single yet, it, the exemption is well over $11 million. So if you give $60,000, so you have that much less when you die. For most people in terms of federal and state tax today, that's not an issue. In terms of New York State, it's a little bit different. New York says you can give the $15,000 a year tax-free. Anything over that would come off your exemption, but only or, or basically would come back into your state if you died within three years of the gift. So if you gave away $60,000 for two years, and then within three years you died, that's 120 that comes back into your state. But if you survive the gift by three years, then it doesn't affect your New York state exemption at all. You still get the full amount. And so again, uh, when I say not all, not all Medicaid qualifying trusts are the same, you have to look and see, does it have lifetime beneficiaries who are entitled to gifts of principal? Does it have to be up to the annual amount? Does it say for any purpose? Does it say for health education, maintenance and support? So I'll tell you something I used to tell my law students. You have to go back to the document. What does the document say? And that will then dictate what can be done. Okay, next one. Thank you. Yep, next, next question. I have an irrevocable trust and want to change the name of trustee on the trust and on the deed of my home, which is already owned by my trust. How can I change the trustee name on the home deed? Okay, so in terms of whether you can change the trustee or not, you have to look at the trust document. I'm going to sound like a broken record here. Um, I tell you that today when I do trust, I always, uh, Medicaid qualifying trust, I give my client the right to change the trustee, but I didn't always do that because there was a time when Medicaid had held that if the grantor retained the right to change the trustee, then it was not a Medicaid qualifying trust. So I do have some trusts out there that did not allow the client to change the trustee. How we could deal with that is we could restate or amend the trust to give that power to the grantor and if you do that, uh, you can do that as long as all the beneficiaries are of adult age and they agree to the, uh, the change in writing, that they consent as beneficiaries and the grantor also consents. And that's an amendment. And sometimes you have the right to change the beneficiary. So if they're not all adults, you can change it. So it's uh, only adults are beneficiaries and they, then they can agree to it. Um, your question makes it a little sticky because you may, the trustee that you may be wanting to change may be one of those beneficiaries. So you really have to see if you have the right to change the beneficiaries and that's using a limited power of appointment, which is also drafted into the Medicaid qualifying trust. Um, so let me say that in lay people's terms. So say you have a trust that says, I leave my everything to my three children and you have two daughters, a son, and your son's the trustee and you have a falling out with him, you don't want him to be the trustee, but you know he's not going to agree to any amendment to that. If you have what we call a power of appointment and most Medicaid qualifying trusts do, you can first change your trust to say, I only make my two daughters the beneficiaries. And then you can amend the trust with all the bells and whistles and changes that you want and only your two daughters have to consent because now they're the only beneficiaries. And that's one way to do it. So um, in terms of changing the name, then you can change the name of the trustee if you don't already have it. The deed, um, typically most people don't go to the trouble of changing the name of the trustee on a deed 
because what it would probably mean is doing a new deed. And really, it's only for the purpose of naming the, the name of the trustee. Um, so most people won't do that. But if you do, I suppose you could uh, file a correction deed. And it would be the cost of the deed and the filing fee. Thank you. Next question. This is a follow-up to a previous question, which I'll read you the initial question first. The initial question which you answered was, can a trustee remove money from the living expenses of the person who the trustee was made for? The additional question is, just to confirm, Medicaid irrevocable trust. The grantor is not currently on Medicaid. It is better to remove the income portion for the grantor month or yearly due to possible job layoffs. Okay, I don't, uh, I don't under, really understand that the question, so I'm going to try and dissect it, and maybe I'll hear it. I'm thinking that the trust provides that the grantor is entitled to the income, um, and usually the trust will say that it should be paid monthly, or it could be paid quarterly, or at least annually, and you should follow whatever the terms of the trust are. Um, whether the person's on Medicaid now or in the future, do not violate the trust. If it doesn't say that you can pay principal, you know, obviously if it's a Medicaid trust, you can't pay principal. All you can do is pay the income. And I would give them the income, but not principal, whether on Medicaid now or later. Because when they look back at that trust over the five years, if they see that you've given principal back to the grantor, it's, it's not gonna, you've poisoned the trust. It's not gonna be worth the paper it's written on. It will not do the job. But right in if I didn't answer the question, I, I wasn't clear on it. What's the next question? Next question, what type of trust should be set up? A, to protect surviving spouse from elder financial abuse from others when spouse is in, uh, incapable of making financial decisions. And B, to ensure children from previous marriages receive assets when related parent passes when surviving spouse remarries. Okay, I, I will have to come back to A because I'm not sure, you'll have to repeat that question. But typically, sure. I mentioned briefly a bypass and a marital trust. And those are trusts that could be created in your will or in a revocable trust, or you could do a separate lifetime trust that uses your exemption. So for instance, if the New York State exemption, I think it's 5.8584 million. If you are married and a spouse and you have children from prime marriage and you wanna make sure that your children get that money um, after your spouse dies, in the case that you predecease your spouse, then you wouldn't want to make an outright gift to that spouse. You would want to leave it to them in a trust, and it could be a credit shelter trust or a marital trust. Typically, a credit shelter trust can make your spouse and your children permissible beneficiaries. It could say that your spouse is primary. It could limit your spouse to income. Um, it could give principal or income to your children. There are many different ways of doing it. Um, and then the marital trust would be limited to your spouse. You cannot name another beneficiary. And you could limit it to your spouse having income or they could have principal distribution. So you can design those marital and bypass trusts with your assets when you die to give your spouse an interest. And then it would provide that at your death, it would go to your children. So your spouse would not be able to divert that to their own children. And if they remarried, their new spouse wouldn't have an interest. And then how you want to control that is how you would draft it. You might say, I'm going to put a house in this bypass trust and I want my spouse to be able to live there. But when they die, I want the house to go to my children. In that case, you would say, and if it's real property, they have the right to live there, but they have to pay all the carrying charges. You might say, I have a CD for $200,000. I want my spouse to get the income but not be able to invade the principal. So they would get the income every year, and when they died, the principal would go to your children. So again, not every bypass and marital trust is the same. Those are the kind of questions that you've got to go through and the analysis, and then the trust can be drafted the proper way to protect your children. 
What was the first part of that, the A part list? Sure, the first part of that was um, what type of trust should be set up to protect the surviving spouse from elder financial abuse from others when spouse is incapable of making financial decisions. Okay, so again, I think it's the same thing. But the, um, I'll take it the wife. The wife dies first. She wants to leave money for the care and comfort and support of her spouse, but she, um, and, but she's afraid of elder abuse. So one is you decide what type of distributions you want to be made for that uh, spouse. Do you want it to be principal or income? Um, do you want it to be your whole estate or a portion of it? And then the most important thing is who do you choose as trustee? Um, you're certainly not going to choose the person who may be abusing them. Uh, you could use an institution, although it would have to be a lot of money for that, or you choose uh, some trusted individuals, whether it's your children or your children and an independent party. You name the trustees, you give them the standard, and then they will protect the spouse. Um, one thing I will note that if you do a living trust, the intervivos trust, uh, you're really going to have to limit your spouse to income only when you die if you want to be protected from Medicaid. If you have a spouse that you think may need Medicaid um, in order to avoid uh, and to make it a special needs trust where Medicaid can't get it and you can still give the spouse support, meaning principal as well as income, that can be done in a will document because a trigger supplemental needs trust, which is what that is, in a will document is an exception to the major over 1993 legislation. So let me say it again. Say that you have a moneyed spouse and she wants to leave $500,000 for the care and support of her husband, but she doesn't want Medicaid to get the money. She cannot create uh, the trust that she creates for him has to be income only, so he can get the income. So if the income is 4% a year, that's $20,000 a year. The 500,000 will stay in the trust. She can't give him the principal because it's a lifetime intervivos trust. However, if she has a will document that leaves 500,000 to him in a trust, it can allow him to have both principal and income at the discretion of the trustee and it can be a special needs trust and Medicaid cannot count it. So it can be much more generous, but it has to be done in a will document. I see two Thank more questions. You. Next, yes, next question. I have an irrevocable Medicaid trust. The trust contains two investment accounts. One firm paid dividends directly to trust and trustee paid me with check from trust. The other firm made dividend deposit to my personal account. Is this okay? Yes. As long as you got, whether you got the uh, interest from the trustee or directly from the investment company, doesn't matter as long as you only got the income and no principal. Great, next question. If all of my assets are payable on death except my house and a piece of land worth, le worth less than $5 million, what advantage is a trust over just having a will? Okay, so uh, assets under $5 million. I think it's not a matter of how much the assets are worth. Let, you know, the story I love to tell is the client in New York City who uh, actually his friends came to us when he already had Alzheimer's disease. He, uh, he needed their care. He only had $250,000. He had an apartment in New York City. His relatives were no wife, no children, no known cousins, no known heirs by blood or marriage. Um, his parents were long gone. They were born in two foreign countries. And his two friends were his power of attorney. And he left a will that when he died, it would go to these two friends. Problem is he died with a quarter of a million dollars and we couldn't probate the will. Because to probate the will, we'd have to find all his heirs. So we had to hire genealogists in one, Egypt and in France to find out who the known heirs were so we could give them notice. And when we couldn't find them, there was a kinship hearing. Um, right now, your head should be going ka-ching, 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 because they cost a lot of money 
and a couple of years to get that will probated. If the money had been in a trust when he died, they would have paid his bills and taken the money. So it's not necessarily the amount that's in it, it's who is otherwise entitled to get notice on that will and are they going to be friendly? Are they readily available? Are they going to object? Because that's what makes probate expensive. I have another question there. Yes, another question. If I have a Medicaid irrevocable trust prior to marriage, would my spouse only be eligible for the income? Okay, so the question is, if I have a, a Medicaid qualifying trust, income only, I created it during the marriage, and would my spouse be entitled to the income after I die? Yes. Okay, so I don't know, you'd have to look at the trust. Chances are, if you were not married, didn't have a spouse, the trust ended at your death. So I, I think it probably, your spouse would not be entitled to the income. In addition, I don't think your spouse is entitled to one third of the asset. Uh, usually a surviving spouse is entitled to one third of your assets when you die. And that would include a Medicaid qualifying trust, but not one that was created before the marriage. Thank you. I don't have any additional questions at the moment. Okay. So I think what, what's our time here? What time is it? We've got a three, a two, almost 250. Okay, so I'm going to, I could talk about a lot of other different trusts. I'm going to mention them here, but um, um, I, we'll have to save this for part two. Uh, besides the islet and the Medicaid qualifying trust, there are a number of other trusts that are increasingly being used. Um, one is a defective grantor trust. And we use that in order to get assets out of an estate when there's a taxable estate or there may be a taxable estate. And uh, that is a completed gift. But the grantor, the person, so say dad creates an, uh, we call it an idget, an irrevocable defective grantor trust. He puts the assets in the trust, they're out of his estate, they get valued as of that date, uh, but he still could be responsible for the income tax. And by paying the income tax, if he has a taxable state, he's actually letting that trust grow tax-free and he's paying the income tax from money that would otherwise be taxable in his estate. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up now is what I see what's on the horizon. This stimulus bill is huge. Uh, the, the deficit is tremendous. And I think that the federal exemption, the way it is now, is not gonna last. I know it was supposed to sunset in 2025. I think it's going to go down. If we have a Democratic, um, I think no matter whether it's Republican or Democrat, the exemption is going to go down. But I know that uh, as far as Democrats go, uh, two and a half to three and a half million dollars is likely where it may go. I don't have a crystal ball. So what happens is, what if you now have $6 million and you've been relying on the fact that the federal exemption is 11? You might, before that exemption goes down, put assets into a defective grant or trust using that $11 million exemption. And if you use that, then you get it out of your estate. And if you later die, I think someone's mic's on. If you later die, exemption, uh, it doesn't matter if the exemption is two and a half million because you got that six million out of your estate when the exemption was still 11 million. So I think that this year I'll be drafting a lot of uh, defective grant to a trust. There are many different ways to do it. Uh, similar to that is a spousal uh, lifetime access trust where you get assets out of your estate, basically like a credit shelter trust and it won't be taxable in the husband, you know, either spouse's estate. It's going to be protected from creditors and it can be protected from Medicaid. But those are more sophisticated tools um, and a lot of it will be depending upon uh, what uh, higher net worth people are doing. But um, I think we're gonna see a lot of that going forward. Um, 
The other thing is that I wanted to tell you is there are two things that I, I add to a lot of my trust now. One is a trust protector, and that's someone you name who's independent, who can easily amend a trust or change terms or change trustee. It's a good way to avoid any litigation or having to go to court to change a trust if the trust document itself doesn't. And the other thing is decanting. We're doing a lot of decanting to where we're taking old trusts, irrevocable trusts that we can amend and decanting them into new improved trusts that have better terms on it. And that is called decanting. Like you decant wine, you pour one into another receptacle, you leave all the bad residue resident there and you have a new improved trust. And we, we could do a, a whole uh, seminar just on decanting. Great. Thank you, everyone.